morning and welcome to another Morning Live with Real Estate Mindset. And don't forget you guys, these live videos are for our community. Our community, basically, we can just grow together, share our perspectives together. So don't forget that, all right? I want you guys to keep commenting below. Today, I will have some quiz questions for you where I'm going to ask you guys some questions. And before I move on, I'm going to obviously wait for the correct answer. Now, obviously, you guys, this week, interest rates, mortgage interest rates have absolutely spiked. And obviously, now we're starting to figure out that we may not get any rate cuts this year. And obviously, because the market is saying, oh, no rate cuts this year, we're probably going to get rate cuts this year because now the market is saying we're not. So, you know, on top of that, guys, keeping our, you know, as a community doing these live videos, we are able to keep our pulse on the housing market. But also, I'm able to, you know, together with you guys, help you grow as far as your purchasing power and empowerment as a consumer purchasing real estate. Now, the tricky thing for me is you guys have different levels of skills, right? And you guys are in different markets and have different goals. So it's really difficult for me to make, you know, cover everything that I want to cover. But I'm going to tell you guys right now, I will always side with caution when it comes to consumers because I lost everything myself. And so don't forget that. And you guys, uh, without further ado, classes and sessions. So before I begin, I want to ask a question and I'm going to throw up some hellos real quick. Now, what, I've, what have I been telling you guys? And I want you to comment below, okay? The quizzing is starting. What have I been telling you guys changes every day? Not interest rates, but what? What do we look at instead of interest rates every single day? And I want to say good morning to everyone real quick. P, nice, good morning. Raymond, I love this man. I love Raymond. He's such a cool guy. Very huge part of our community, as is Troy. Uh, Trey, sorry, Troy. Gee, I want to watch that movie, Trey. Troy's a really good movie. But anyways, Trey, love you, brother. Thank you for putting the community together. This is a great person. JK, always nice to see you, man. I like that great hammerhead. Christy as well. I am. I'd like to see you. I am more in the Discord. Dean, super cool guy. So just good morning, everyone. Ray as well. Um, so let's see if anyone got that right answer. So what are we looking at, you guys? Every Hey, there's Cindy. There's Volvo. Oh my gosh, look at this guy. I love my Johnny. I don't care who knows. I love this man. All right, so what are we looking at, you guys? I mean, okay, so Dean said the 10 year. Okay, yes, the 10 year does change. We watch the 10 year because it tracks mortgage interest rates. But what are we watching as consumers? Like, if we want to lock a rate, what are we watching? Christy, you got this right last time. Not necessarily the 10 year. So we're, we've already looked at houses, okay? We want to lock our interest rate. What are we monitoring every day? It's not the 10 year. It's not the 10 year, you guys. What are we monitoring every day? It's not inventory. Come on, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, oh, shoot. I'm going to give you guys a clue real quick. All right, this, okay? Come on, guys. What do we do? What do we watch every single day? What's changing? No one's got that right so far. How are you guys doing? Where, Christy, where are you at? No, not CPI. Volvo, it's nice to see you, brother. Not CPI. You guys, we review the pricing. Don't forget that, okay? My heart is hurt. You guys, my heart is hurt. Yeah, Terry got it. There you go, Terry. Terry, yes, yes. Te it's, yeah, the 10-year, yes, but like after we found a house. No, not the <laughs> You guys, it's the pricing, okay? So don't forget that. We, there's dental. There's my man, dental. Dental, I love you. Don't forget, Charles also loves you, my man. I know we're, you know, no, not mortgage rates. Yes, pricing, pricing. You guys, don't forget that. You need to understand that as a consumer, it's the pricing that changes. If you guys understand how pricing works, it's easier for you guys to shop a deal and get a better discount on your mortgage rate. Don't forget, like when you buy real estate, normally, generally, if it's, unless it's all cash, if you buy real estate, like there's a secondary nightmare called getting your mortgage. Okay. The first part is like negotiating, getting your contract signed. But the second really hard part is getting your mortgage. And one of the only things that we can do, unfortunately, as consumers, when we're going through the mortgage process is hold the lender accountable. I cannot tell you guys that enough. You got to hold the lender accountable and get in your conditional documentation to them exactly how they requested it as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, so don't forget that. All right. I appreciate all you guys. All right. So we're going to get started right now, uh, in our mortgage update. So we're going to start with our mortgage update. You guys keep commenting below, uh, and I'm going to get into pricing. I'm going to go back into pricing, but first I wanted to show you guys the economic calendar real quick. So you guys know what's happening this week. So we got some really cool stuff, actually a lot of stuff, uh, this week. So the first thing I wanted to let you guys know, remind you guys, we have CPI coming out on Wednesday, April 10th. 
Uh, I think it's going to come in hot specifically because of rent. It appears really, really surprising, actually. It appears that rent, at least in March, has shot up. And I know rent is a lagging indicator, but that's what I'll be looking at when CPI comes out Wednesday. Shelter, 100% shelter. I want to know what shelter is coming in at. That comes out on Wednesday. Thursday, PPI comes out. Okay, so we got some big stuff. Obviously, we got some speeches, all kinds of speeches. Uh, so it's a really, really big day. All right, we got it, all kinds of stuff. We got consumer sentiment, but really, you guys, Wednesday and Thursday of this week is going to be really, really important. Now, let's jump on over to the 10 year. Now, we finally got relief after about what, a week and a half of the 10 year shooting up. And I say relief. Okay, let me take that back. I want the 10 year to be high because I want demand to be low enough so that we can get inventory inventory of home back. And I'm talking about existing. I am not talking about new homes, two different markets completely. Don't forget that guys. Now we're sitting at 4.377. This is down, that's down a decent amount say five basis points. But take a look at this guys. This is really what I wanted to show you here. Uh, and then I'm gonna go into the pricing. Look at the last three months. So we have been on a roll for a little over three months. In, in other words, what I'm trying to say is the 10 year, and again, this affects mortgage rates, has been going up for three months. You can see that we are at the highest level of that 10 year in three months. Okay, so that's pretty, thank God. You guys remember like all last year, I was like, you guys, we need elevated interest rates going into spring. I told you guys, if we don't have elevated interest rates going into spring, that I was super worried. So thank God we have elevated interest rates. Thank God. And I'll go over inventory. Inventory has jumped up as well. But first, I'm going to, I have some quiz questions. Now we're going to go back into pricing. Okay. I'm going to show you guys, let me throw it up on the screen. Actually, I'm going to show you guys this pricing sheet. This is a pricing sheet. Okay. Right here. All right. So this is a pricing sheet right here. And what I want you guys to do is I want you to focus on the 6.375 and I want you to focus on the 6.5. Now, this is a rate sheet that I went over with you guys on our last live. OK, and what you're going to notice, remember, I said the pricing is what matters as a consumer. This is what you watch every single day. And this is what you base your decision to lock your interest rate on. So if I was in the process of a mortgage, I would call my loan officer every single day and I would ask them for an updated price sheet. So don't forget that, an updated price sheet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the updated rates. These rates you're looking at, this pricing sheet is about, I think about a week old. So where I've circled is the 6.375 and the 6.5. And, and I want you guys to remember that a 6.375 cost in this situation $2,100. Now a 6.5 is a refund. So remember a 6.5 is a refund of $712. Okay. So that was last week's pricing. So now that interest rates have gone up, obviously that's going to change. So remember you guys, you got a refund at six and a half. Now look at the rates as of yesterday. Let me show you guys this. Okay. Look at the change. Okay. You guys see the changes immediately, right? You should. Now, remember, I said, let's focus on, let me turn my pen out on, I'm so sorry. Let's focus on the six point, why is my pen not working? It better be charged. If it's not charged, I'm, Johnny's going to roast me. Actually, Johnny's going to roast me no matter what, to be honest with you. All right, so I said, look at the 6.375. Now, remember the rate sheet I just showed you, the cost was what? $2,100, okay? So the 6.375 went from a cost of $2,100, you see this, to a cost of, almost $5,000. Do you, you guys starting to understand how to track interest rates as a consumer? This is how you track as a consumer, which means, oh my gosh, I should have locked last week, right? And so you develop a pattern. Now look at this, you guys, look at the 6.5, okay? That's a 6.5. And remember, last week's pricing showed us getting a refund. The bank was paying us money to take a six and a half. They were paying us $712. And look at this, guys. Instead of them paying us, look at it. It now cost $2,100. So we went from a refund to a cost of $2,100. In other words, what I'm trying to explain to you guys is in just one week, and that's all it took. It took only one week. Um, I mean, you guys see what happened. In one week, the cost went up $2,800 for that loan amount. Now, it's a little bit higher loan amount than normal. 
but I mean, the costs are going up, um, obviously. And that's how that works. And I want you guys to always remember that. Now, I also want to let you guys know, we will be doing a market analysis today, again, because I told you these lives are for our community and growing together as consumers. So I will get to that. But don't forget what I'm saying as far as pricing. That may be one of the most important things I can teach you. Now, going back into interest rates, you guys, let's go back into that right now. I'm sorry for that. All right. So there's our 10 year. Let's see the impact on mortgage rates. So here's mortgage rates as of today. Now, you guys, these mortgage rates don't include the decrease in the 10 year that we have witnessed this morning. So this means is, is eventually this will, I think this updates, I think around 1 p.m., Eastern, I think, I can never remember, but this will update today and these rates will drop because the 10 year is dropping. Now we're sitting at conventional interest rates of 7.11%. We will do an FHA versus conventional comparison. I want to point out as well that FHA is at 6.6. .6. Now, just to put it in perspective, how much lower FHA is, look at the 15 year fix right here. FHA mortgages are as low. It will obviously depends on credit, right? It depends on a whole bunch of stuff, but these are, this is average information. Okay. And it looks like it updates at 4 PM Eastern. It says right there, but your FHA is as low as a 15 year mortgage. So just FYI, that's, that's part of the reason why a lot of times FHA is cheaper because not only do they typically have lower mortgage insurance when you just do a minimum down payment, you're talking about interest rates as low as 15 years. I mean, that's kind of a, is that kind of a subsidy to you guys? Cause it's a, you know, government backed loan, government insured loan. Do y'all think that's kind of a subsidy to kind of boost and stimulate uh, the, the, the housing market? Because remember you guys, they decreased mortgage insurance on FHA. Like I think it was either the end of 2022 or in 2023 when we didn't need it, right? We wanted to tighten, not loosen. So, you know, it is what it is. I'll show you guys a comparison. Let me show you what the market is anticipating. Now, obviously the market's always super like, like crazy optimistic every, and I loved Melody. Melody made this point. She's like, I was like, Melody, what about all these bulls? She's like, Travis, it's just the way the world works. Every single niche in America, the sales and the reps are designed to sell you something. They will beat it to death until it blows up in their face and they have no other choice but to acknowledge what's happening. Now, remember you guys, all I'm looking at is at the end of the year. And this is, this is what we were praying. I don't know about y'all, but I know this is what I was praying for. Like literally crossing my hands, please God help us. And we are getting it. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now take a look at this guys. This is saying, okay, 2.5% chance of no rate cut. This is the most, this has been elevated since I've been doing these lives with you. So I think we got to 1.8 was the max. Now we're at 2.5. So the market is starting to say, oh my God, we probably have what? What was the market trying to figure out, you guys? What does the market figure out? What do we have another round of right now? What do you guys think we have another round of right now? Right? Because we have higher for longer, don't we? What do we have, what do we have going on right now, you guys, that's, that's kicking these interest rates up and adjusting the expectations? What's going on right now? Why no more rate cuts? I mean, I want to see you guys comment this. I want to know you guys are following along. This is, this is very specific information here. Why is this happening, you guys? You should know this. Now, obviously, I know uh, we're not in recession, right? Another round of beer. <laughs> All right. I like that. So, so we got another round of beer. We got solar. I, I want to take stagflation. Let's just say stagflation. That's a good one. Okay. But this is what I was looking for. You guys, inflation, inflation. Where's it? Yes. More stimulus. Uh, good morning, Charlton. Nice to see you, brother. Inflation. You guys got it. Okay. Inflation, inflation, inflation. Johnny, I love that, man. <laughs> I love it. Anyways, so you guys, we got inflation and the market's starting to see that. They're like, oh my God, maybe rates weren't high enough. Maybe we got too much deficit spending, but look at this. This is crazy. I went into next year. Look at next year in January of 2025. Insane. So in January of 2025, the market is still slightly 1.2% chance of no rate cut, even up to January of 2025. So to me, you guys, I'm going to be honest with you. Do you want to know what this means to me? the market's going to crash this year. If the market is now saying, oh, we're not going to crash, <laughs> we're not going to have any rate cuts, that's when it's going to crash. You know, they say that if everyone knows that there's a crash or a collapse coming, that it's not going to happen. And so what do you guys think is going to happen right now? I mean, what do we see in mainstream media? What do we see from the bulls? Everything is resilient just by GDP is great, right? All these things are great. So I'm telling you guys, the, <laughs> the moment that everyone thinks there's not going to crash is when it's going to crash. We'll see that play out, you know, either way, we'll figure out how that works, but let's move on to this. I wanted to show you guys FHA. Okay. So remember I'm, I'm not selling you 
on getting an FHA. What I want to do is, is I want to explain to you guys the difference so that as consumers, you guys can make up your own mind. Now, remember, FHA is looser guidelines, so it is easier to get. FHA does have lower interest rates, kind of substantially. So why wouldn't you want FHA all the time? This is the reason right here, you guys. It's called MIP, okay? That is the only reason conventional can, can be, listen to me, can't, not always, but can be better than FHA. So FHA has this upfront mortgage insurance premium, which means you have to pay that fee upfront. And I highlighted that here for you based on a $350,000 purchase price. The upfront mortgage insurance fee is 1.75%. So almost two points. So remember, FHA charges you almost two points just to do an FHA loan. So you got to overcome that hurdle. Look at that $6,100. But here's what makes the monthly payment cheaper. I want you guys to focus on this number, the annual FHA MIP percentage, which is 0.55. And that is the other reason why FHA can beat out conventional. 0.55 for mortgage insurance is very low. Look at what this resorts to as far as your monthly mortgage insurance, only $154. Now here's another problem. This never ever goes away unless you refinance possibly, or if you sell your house, or if you have 10% down, it will go away in 11 years, but that's the disadvantage. Okay. So the question is you guys, in what situation does conventional have a lower mortgage insurance than FHA? Okay, so remember, FHA is 0.55. So here's a PMI calculator. Okay, I have this link down in all of my videos. So you guys should be able to access this pretty easy. Now, remember, you guys, for FHA is 0.55. Look at what it is for conventional if your credit score is 620 to 639. It's 1.5%, which would have your monthly PMI at $416. The reason I'm showing you this is if you have credit score between 620 and 640, you probably don't want to get a conventional mortgage. And, and then a lot of times, you guys, loan officers won't always tell you that. That's why I'm always talking about this. Loan officers will not always go over your options. That's why I'm going over your options, right? You have to ask the professionals to do things for you. If you have a 620 to 639 FICO score, stay away from conventional. Just my opinion. I'm not a financial advisor. Understand that this is just entertainment. It's just entertainment, okay? But here's all the links to the data and here's all the helpful tools. But look at this, guys. The only time it becomes more cheaper to get a conventional mortgage at 5% down is if you have a 760 or above. And then the PMI goes to 0.46. Isn't that crazy? Is that crazy, guys? So let's just reflect. <laughs> you have to have a seven, if you're gonna have a minimum down payment on conventional, you have to have a 760 or higher for it to be like a slam dunk conventional. Now look at this, even with the 740 to 759, look at this guys, your PMI is still higher than FHA. So even if I have a 750 credit score, my PMI is higher, it's 0.58. And remember you guys, look at FHA, it's 0.55. So in other words, what I'm saying, you know, again, there's a lot of misinformation. I'm not saying get an FHA. What I'm saying is again, the differences. Now let's move on to, our amortization schedule. All right, I'm gonna go on my amortization schedule. I want you guys to take a look at this. Now, this is what I hear a lot of, all right? I hear a lot of belittling. I hear a lot of bullying uh, about us renting. You guys, I'm gonna be the first person to say, I don't like renting. I think that we should all own real estate. I think owning real estate is such a blessing. Uh, I think it could really help us as Americans. But I do believe that purchasing real estate right now at this moment is very, dangerous and it is very toxic. And I say that because the price, the price is sky, it is the interest rate. So the way I figure it is obviously, you know, 4 million people still purchase houses, okay? I think we should all wait till after the till after the presidential election, unless we find a great deal right now. If we find a great deal right now and we understand all the tools that we use to do that, so be it. But I really think we should wait, guys. And I'm not trying to pick on people. I'm not trying to do any of that. I'm just giving you my opinion. I don't think this is sustainable. But look at the amortization schedule. Okay, this is sorry for preaching. Okay, here's your amortization schedule. If there's one thing I want REM members to be strong at, I want all of you guys to be experts on this freaking trap. This is a death contract trap. And it is called an amortization schedule. I want real estate mindset members to be the best mortgage payers ever and to get out of debt sooner than anyone else in America. 
All right. The way you do that is all you do is you pay down your principal. But first I wanted to point out, I get this all the time. Okay. This is what I hear all the time. If you're renting, you pay 100% interest and you make your landlord rich, right? I hear that all the time. But I also wanted to point out that interest rates are so elevated right now. If we buy right now at a 7.11%, instead of making our landlord rich, we make the mortgage lender rich. So I guess you just got to figure out who do you want to make rich? Okay. And it's not really rich, but here's the you know, total amount of interest. And there's a reason why I'm showing you this. So the loan amount's 328. Okay. But your total interest over 30 years, okay, is 466,000. Now, if we divide that into the 328, you guys, see, let me see here. Okay. You want to know what the interest is? Okay. So it's hundred percent interest for renting, right? But you guys, here's the problem. There's interest on your loan. So there's 152% interest. Again, if you buy right now and you get that interest rate of 7.11, which you guys should be above average, you guys should be getting lower than 7.11. Don't forget that. You guys, it's 152% interest. And that's, and what if you refinance? If you refinance, you start all the way over again. So if you want to get rid of the interest, all you do is put money towards your principal. In fact, if you put little less than $19,000 down, Okay, look at all the interest you save. Just paying your loan amount down to 309, okay, from 328 three, to 309. So one payment, you guys save $110,000 in interest. So you save $110,000 in interest. All of these years of interest, you don't pay because you paid your loan balance down. All right, I want you guys to be killers. I want you guys to be talking to your friends, your families, your uncles, your cousins, and you tell them, get yourself out of that trap. But remember, if you refinance, this all starts over again. So if you refinance, I guess what I'm trying to say, y'all, if you're going to refinance, get a 15 year, shorten your, shorten your amortization schedule. That's, that's really what I'm trying to say here. Okay. Now, uh, before I go into our first video, which is going to be on inflation, I want to recap on a few things. Okay. Uh, from the mortgage section. So a few things I'm hoping that you guys learn on that mortgage section, always remember like, okay, so, so the question is, is, how do you get a lower rate in any environment? Okay, whether it's right now or two years from now, how do you get a lower interest rate? Okay, so few ways to get a lower interest rate as a consumer. We talked about one way, which is the loan type. So you can get a lower interest rate or a higher interest rate depending on the loan type. Okay, another thing, huge one right here, you guys, credit. Now your credit more drastically impacts conventional loans versus FHA loans and the pricing, not the rate. It's not the rate. It's the pricing. Remember LLPA, it's the pricing. All right. So on top of that, your down payment. A lot of times, the more down you get a break, especially with conventional, not as much FHA and also compensating factors like low debt to income ratio and having savings in your account will also help get you a lower interest rate. Now we're going to go into our first video, which is June, maybe too soon for an interest rate cut. Uh, probably because, um, in a way inflation happening right now. Do you guys, uh, if you can comment below, why do you think we have, well, maybe you don't think, but if you think we have like more inflation right now, like a runaway or an increased inflation, why do you guys think we have that? If you can comment below, why do you think we still have inflation? Okay. I'm going to throw up your comments, but uh, first let's get into the video and enjoy. Where is my video? Okay. Hold on one minute, you guys. I am going to add this to the stage right now. CAO Alan McKnight. Alan, great to have you back. Audio is okay. Time. Um, when you say not enough need, what, what exactly do you mean? Well, it's exactly what Steve was just talking about, which is the fact that with the data that's been coming in, both on the inflation front as well as on the jobs front, it's really hard to see a path where the Fed feels compelled and feels the need to really step in to do something because they feel that either one, the job market is coming off the rails or that inflation has finally really subdued itself. Is, do you believe we are in a restrictive range? And uh, is that in, in itself worth uh, worth the cut, at least from an insurance standpoint, uh, given some of the uncertainties coming at us and say in the back half of the year? I think that's exactly what they're grappling with. And it's the old, uh, the adage or lyric from the clash, which is if I stay, there will be trouble. If I go, there will be double. And, <laughs> you know, should I stay or should I go on the on the current line? And I think they're, they're really struggling with that because they would like to see inflation come down more. Um, be careful what you wish for. You hate to see that the employment market really comes off. But I think it's more of a hedge if you see anything between now and the end of the year. But as is, is noted at the outset, we could see a path where 
they stay on hold for a bit longer or as long as they, they feel compelled. Do you see a path where they actually hike? And I ask this because J.P. Morgan Chairman and CEO Jamie Dimon had his annual shareholder letter out this morning, and in it he addressed the the perspective of a potential. Uh, he said at least that they're prepared for a broad range of interest rates from two percent to eight percent or even more. Um, you know, what if the Fed does hike, as Dimon says that he's at least prepared for? You know, our worldview is one of probabilities. And so while that is a possibility, we think it's a low probability in terms of the economy reheating and really starting to see a need for for rates to move that much higher or for a rate increase at this point. It doesn't mean it's it's completely off the table, but it's just one of those very low probability outcomes that we don't think investors should spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about, barring another real push higher in inflation right now. And we just don't see that in the cards, although we think it's going to be stubbornly high. So do you think then that the Fed has uh, adequately accomplished its goal of a soft landing? I just want to bring up a quote again from uh, this morning's letter where Diamond talks about how equity values by most measures are at the high end of the valuation range and credit spreads are incredibly or extremely tight. Uh, he said these markets seem to be pricing in at a 70 to 80 percent chance of a soft landing, modest growth, along with declining inflation and interest rates. He believes the odds are a lot lower than that. Um, you know, do you see evidence that uh, there could be some risk factors out there that derail this soft landing that the market's been pricing in? Well, I think from, from our perspective is one that if you were to see the employment picture change markedly, and we think that would occur only if companies saw a material decline in terms of, of revenue projections, because they see a real softness coming through. We haven't seen that in the consumer yet. We've seen it on the low income consumer side. We haven't seen it on the high end yet. And we think we would need to see that type of slowdown for the commensurate amount of cuts on a job basis. But inflation is, is not getting down to the Fed target anytime in the near future. And I think that is the challenge where the economy slows a bit more than we're expecting. And you start to see a bit of a pullback there. But again, it doesn't seem like the, the highest probability outcome. Um, but it's certainly out there. And it's one that we talk about quite a bit in terms of as we go into earnings season this week, will we start to hear from corporate executives that they're seeing any signs of softness <laughs> in terms of spend either on the consumer or the corporate side? OK, guys, so, uh, you know, let me know what you think. I wanted to throw this comment up here and I'm going to get started on doing a, our subdivision analysis. So very, very important. And don't forget, this will be chaptered. I want you guys to come back to the subdivision analysis, whether you're a realtor or you need your realtor to do it. So I'm going to get into that. But first, I wanted to I saw you guys going back and forth with this comment. Uh, Dad has a good point, and And I want to be fair to the point. If you have that much interest each year, you will be itemizing. So what people in the comment section were talking about, I believe was based on when I said, you know, people say you get 100%, you pay 100% in rent, but you pay 140% back in interest to the, I'm sorry, 150%, okay? Now in all fairness, and I'm, I want you guys to understand, I am not a CPA, okay? But I know, uh, I, I, I do a lot of my own taxes, okay? But I'm not a CPA, you always talk to your CPA. But one of the things that I was missing this year, I'm talking about my own situation to give credit to dad, is I didn't, I wasn't able to, in, like I wasn't able to exceed my standard deduction. Okay. And I've always been able to exceed my standard deduction. So it hurt me this year. I had to pay double the income tax, which was real. I'm not rich. You guys that hurt me bad. So the benefit of owning versus renting again, is that interest, that interest goes a long way. I can usually, again, uh, based on, uh, interest donations and what was the other one? Medical expenses. I can usually always, do that. So there is benefit in owning uh, and paying that much interest. Okay. And that is talk to a CPA, but for me, I get to do the interest and I wasn't able to do that this year, but nevertheless, you guys, it's still, I mean, you got to decide you want to buy the overpriced house, but good point, dad, you know, um, you do have to exceed the standard deduction though. I want to, you know, again, I'm not a CPA. I I'm saying myself, I have to exceed the standard deduction before I really get that benefit. So credit to you on that buddy, uh, because that is a benefit, but there was another comment he made where your rent is not tax deductible. Okay. So he made that comment. He's like, well, you can tax deduct this, but you can't tax deduct your rent. 
He's right overall, but again, I'm not a CPA, but I do my taxes. I am self-employed. You see the office right here? This office that you guys see right here is in my rental house. Now I get to claim all of the expenses that I spend on this section of my house because I'm self-employed. And because I'm self-employed, I can claim something called a home office expense. And part of my home office expense allows me to actually use the rent as a tax deduction. This is my own situation. Contact your CPA. So that's kind of, you know, but I'm going to be straight up, man. I really wish I had my tax deduction for mortgage interest this year. I had it on my schedule E, but I, I was talking about, you know, on my personal tax return, uh, not, not any schedules. So I hope that made sense. Now, what we're going to do, you guys, is we're going to do a market analysis. Okay. And I'm going to just throw this up like this. Now, don't forget. Okay. Market analysis is very important. Real estate is about what? Okay, what's real estate about you guys? Hyper local. Everything we've been going over has been macro. If you guys really need, want to know and find out if you're getting a great deal, you got to go hyper local into the subdivision. And I'll pull up an appraisal. I have a new appraisal to share with you guys, but you have to go into the subdivision and you have to review sold homes. Okay. And so we're going to do that exercise today. And I want you guys to understand <clears throat> either, hopefully, you guys can do this, but if you don't have access to MLS, the only way that I know how to do this is by you using Zillow. <clears throat> and I'll try to show you guys that at the end. But also remember this, you don't have to be a genius to get a great deal in real estate. You just have to understand simple baby math. I mean, baby math, like literally a five grade could two plus two equals four. You guys, it's not, you're not a genius if you became a millionaire in real estate, you just did the right stuff and it's all simple math. You don't have to pay $10,000 to join a membership to learn how to buy real estate. I'm showing you for free. Behind the scenes, behind the scenes. So anyways, anyways, okay. So let's do this right now. Okay, here's the property we're gonna take a look at. Let me show you guys. I think what I'll do is I'll do it like, maybe I'll do it like this. Um, where is, like this. Um, or should I do it like this? Okay, I'm gonna do it like this. So I'm gonna be filling out the subdivision form. So remember you guys, this is all you have to do. You put your subdivision, you find your price, size, tax, mortgage, and we're gonna figure out uh, wedge and cash flow. And it's gonna take us about 10 minutes. So here's the property I wanna analyze, okay? So remember, the first thing is, now that I'm interested in this property, I wanna make note of the price. And you guys, uh, just FYI, the price has been dropped $90,000. I try not to get too hyped, but my market is way, way different than so many other people's markets because I'm seeing signs of sellers under distress right now. And I have been seeing that. And I have a whole bunch of new construction. But regardless, the purchase price is $350,000. Remember, you guys, we also need to use the square footage. So I'm writing down the square foot. The square footage is 3249 Now, remember, I want to see if I cash flow. So I need to scroll down and figure out what the property taxes are. Look at the property taxes, guys. Holy crap. So the property taxes, okay, per year. This is Texas. This is bad. So I'm talking about a $350,000 house. The taxes are $10,641 per year. Y'all see that? $10,641 a year. All right, so here's what I have so far. So I've done the price, I've done the size, and I've done the taxes. Now what I wanna do is, let's do our analysis, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into the MLS, and I'm gonna start doing a subdivision analysis on the property subdivision, which is right here. So remember you guys, this is hyper-local. If you wanna do a good deal, if you don't wanna pay $10,000 to learn how to buy real estate, all you gotta do is the simple math when it comes to the analysis and you only need to look at stuff in the subdivision. You can do this in, on Zillow on a limited aspect. So I put the subdivision here and I'm only gonna look at sold property over the last 365 days. Okay, so what this tells me is I have 15 comps in that subdivision. All right, you see this? So 15 comps, you see that right here. Now, I would, you know, eliminate outliers here normally, but I'm just going to select all. And you see the square footage is all about the same, surprisingly. So I select all this data. Now, if you don't have this system, you add the purchase prices and the square footage together and divide by the amount of comps. So I already have the system set up, but I, if, if I don't have the system, I'm adding all of this column and I'm dividing by 15. And then I'm adding all of this column 
and I'm on dividing by 15, but I don't have to do that. I can just hit this button right here and it automatically does it for me. Okay, and so what I know you guys, this is pretty crazy. The average price per square foot was $149. Isn't that crazy? So I'm gonna write that down here, $149 a square foot, okay? And 44 cents. See how I'm doing this? Very, very simple, very, very simple. All right, so now I can calculate whether or not I have a wedge, but I also wanna calculate cash flow. So remember, the way that I determine cash flow, I do the same thing. It's the exact same thing, look at this, guys. All right, let me do this one more time for you. Okay, so I'm just gonna do the same thing, except I'm gonna go into the rental MLS. I wish you guys had access to this. If, you, if the public had access to MLS, all I would be doing was these videos. I mean, I could train you guys like crazy. All right, so I'm just putting the subject property uh, subdivision there. I'm looking for all the rentals that sold in the last year, okay, or 365 days. I have seven comps, okay, so let me take a look. So here's all seven comps right here. Again, I would add this together and divide. It's very simple math, you guys. I'm gonna select all this. I'm gonna hit stats and tabular, and my average price per square foot is right here. So my average price per square foot for rent is 107. And look at the average square footage. So that's good. So the house I'm interested in is an average square footage. You want rentals to be like the median or the average. You don't want anything too big or too small. Okay. So I'm going to put rent is a dollar and seven a square foot. Okay. So, so far, this should be pretty easy. This is what I have. Now, I gotta do one more hard part. After this next hard part, we are done. I have to try to figure out what my mortgage payment's gonna be, okay? Now, remember, if I have a loan officer, I'll just call my loan officer up, I'll give them the property, they'll recalculate the property taxes. Um, so that's what I should do, right? But for the sake of this video, and if you just are on the fly, I'm gonna show you how to calculate your mortgage payment right here. Okay, let me pull this up now for you guys. Okay, let's do this real quick. Okay, so the purchase price was what? 350,000, okay? Let me put include taxes and insurance. So our purchase price was 350,000. We're gonna do, let's say 5% down. Okay, we're gonna get a lower interest rate. Let's just say our interest rate's 6.675 because I'm using a broker. So let's say it's 6.75. I gotta adjust my property taxes. Remember, I wrote the property taxes down 10,641. The insurance is probably more like $2,000, unfortunately. Okay. But anyways, guys, I mean, I got a quick little, you know, snippet of my mortgage payment. So let me write that down here. Okay. I'm going to write my mortgage payment down right here and then I'm done. Like I can start calculating stuff. I mean, this is so, that's probably the hardest part. What you guys just saw right there, but you could just, again, you guys could just simply rewind this and just see how I did that. Okay. Now, all I have to do now is simple, like multiplication. All right. So I'm going to pull this back up here. Now, what I want to calculate first is my wedge, okay? So the way I calculate my wedge is I multiply the $149 a square foot average by the size of the house, okay? So let's do that real quick. You guys can't see my calculator, I am sorry, but I will just knock that out. So I'm gonna go 149, 44, was it 149? Dang, times three, two, four, nine, gives me a value of $485,530, okay? That's a lot. Now what I do is, is I subtract that 485,000 by the sales price, obviously, okay? So minus 350. Now, obviously you have to take into account, you guys, what? The condition of properties. We'll look at the appraisal here in a minute. So my wedge on this property, you guys, is roughly 135,000. Okay, and again, this is just a quick you know, demo. If I had a customer, I would be doing this a lot more thoroughly, but again, that's square footage. Okay, so I'm going square footage right here times the average price per square foot over the last year. That's how you normally do that. Now, if we start, you know, having a decline in value like we are in Houston, obviously you got to be even more careful because values are going down. This is just based on the last year, right? This is if we base this on 2021, the wedge is completely different. But right now, you guys, 
That's kind of how wedge works. Now understand this is gross wedge because in order to get that wedge, I might have to fix up the property, okay? Now, now that I have my mortgage payment, which is right here, I can calculate my cash flow. So all I do to calculate my cash flow is I take the dollar and seven a square foot. So a dollar and seven a square foot, you see right here that we got from MLS. And I multiply that by the square footage of the house, which is 3,249, which gives me a total of rent that I could possibly get. Again, you guys, you know, this is just kind of a general way to do this. So that would be my rent. Now my mortgage payment is right here, which means my cash flow is nothing. My cash flow is basically nothing. It's $49. Okay, so at least it's in the positive, uh, but it's only $49. And guys, again, if you want, just come back here, watch how I did that. Um, I love it. You know, it, it's just so easy. Now, obviously, you guys, value, and I get this comment all the time, value is not determined based on price per square foot, okay? We talk about this all the time. Value is determined by doing an appraisal. And I have a test question for you guys. And then I'm going to pull up the appraisal that I have right in front of me. I have a new appraisal I'm going to go over with you. Now, remember, I told you guys when looking for comps for the appraisal, you want to use comparable data that is close to the subject property. And you want to look at GLA, which is gross living area. Now, my question to you guys is, is how many comps are used for an appraisal? Okay. How many comps in a comp is a sold house? How many sold houses are used for an appraisal? And remember, it's in a subdivision, guys. Remember that. It's in a subdivision, okay? So it's in a subdivision. How many comps, you guys? Do I use 10, 5? How many comps are used? Yes. Thank you, ET. ET, phone home. ET, phone home. ET, got it. ET stands for extra, Travis. You're being extra. So ET, appreciate you. You got it right. That's right. Three. We got another three. Kim, nope. Three, four. So sometimes when they use over three, like the fourth comparable is like a listing, which almost gives it no, no uh, value weight at all. So let me show you guys an appraisal that I got this week in this market. Let me do it like this. Okay, let me move my head down. Okay, so here's this week's appraisal, okay? Now, remember, there's three comps, right? There's comp one, two, and three. Now, remember when I say, you know, the first thing that I'm looking for when I'm looking for comparable data is I'm looking at the GLA. And what's the GLA? It stands for gross living area, which is square footage. It just doesn't count the garage. And so you see here, right here, that our subject property has 3,200 square feet. Okay. So that's good because look at comp one is very close to that. And comp three is very close to that. Comp two is way smaller. Comp two is way, way smaller. So we don't like comp two, we like comp one. Now, what I wanna ask you guys as well is, let me see, where's the distance at? Where's my distances? Did I block that out? All right, I think I blocked out the distances. Okay, that's all right. Now, what I also wanna show you is this. Appraisals suck because it's based on an opinion and appraisers have huge like variances they can do in adjustments. You guys see that on the bottom here, where it's, let me circle this, where it says net and gross. Those are your thresholds of adjustment. So on comparable number two, he made net and gross adjustments of 16.5%. That's not good. That is a horrible comp. And look at this comp. He made zero adjustments. And on this comp, he made only 2.5. Can you guys see comp three? Okay. So he only made 2.5%. Okay. Now, the reason I wanted to show you that is because the comparable two is bringing down the value because look at the value. Let me move this. You guys look at the value on the net value on comp one and comp two. It's 625,000 and there's barely any adjustments. That's pretty good, right? But look at on comp number three, I'm sorry, on comp number two, the one we don't like, it has the lowest net value, which means comparable number two is bringing down our value. Now, Usually you'll add all three of these together, say, and divide by three, which will come to something like what, 623. But instead of that, for some reason, this came in at 621,000. Okay, you see that? Now the purchase price is 600,000. So what does that mean? It means my client is walking into equity. How's my client walking into equity, you guys? How did I get my client to walk into equity? You guys, do you guys remember my story, how I did that? And I'm gonna say they're walking into more equity than $21,000 because that comp two is horrible comp. I know that because I looked myself, but how was I able to get them a deal like that? 
I was able to do it. I think you guys should. And by the way, they got the best deal in over two years. So I brought them back to 2021 prices. Okay. Still feel guilty, man. I mean, I lost sleep. I still lost sleep because I'm so afraid. Uh, they're just they're very well qualified. They're sick of it. They're like, if it goes down 20%, I'm happy still. I want to move on with my life. I'm like, fine, let's get you a great deal. Um, but I lost sleep over that, man. I'm scared. You know, I'm scared. I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, but I am scared. Uh, they're well qualified. Uh, but the way I was able to do that, you guys, I waived my commission. I waived my commission. I'm telling you guys, the buyer's agents have the power to do what I did. All I did, I went to my customer like, hey guys, come here, come here. I'm going to play the over-optimistic realtor. You guys play the pessimistic customer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the sales agent alone and I'm going to say, okay, listen, we need to get the price for 600,000. Now the price, we got it down to 615, but we needed 600,000. So I was like, listen, okay, I want to make this deal work. I'm willing to sacrifice or waive $6,000 of my commission, but I need you guys to give us another 9,000. You guys, she, she about had a heart attack. I'm telling you, the sales rep was like, what? You're going to waive your commission to make this work? And so by doing that, you guys, the builder and all these petty people in the office buildings with these suits, oh, they're so petty. They're so emotional. They drop their guard. I'm telling you guys, they drop their guard and they're like, dang, this realtor really wants to help. All right, fine. So it's a closeout deal. We're going we're gonna to go another $9,000 and we're going to be done with this. Instead of me having the builder keep their guard up because I want to beat them up. Do y'all see what I'm saying? So we manipulated the sales agent and we had to do it swiftly. So I got him a, you know, I got him a good deal. Uh, I waived $6,000 of commission. And, and, my, and <laughs> the buyers were like, when I did that, their, their eyes like popped up. They're like, Travis, I'm like, you guys, the commission was $18,000. So I'm telling my client, the commission was $18,000. I waived $6,000. There's still $12,000 commission. What did I, I'm like, how did I earn that? I'm asking my client. I'm like, how did I earn $12,000? They're like, okay, fine, Travis. You're emotional. We'll let it go. Fine, fine. I'm like, you guys just need to be safe and get a great deal, right? I mean, I taught them a lot. And I, and I think that she should become a realtor. Anyways, I'm sorry. Let's go into inventory. <laughs> Let's go into inventory. Okay. I want to show you guys the updated inventory because I got some really good news. And this is, and we know that the interest rates are working because inventory is sustaining. Finally, where did I put my pencil? Okay. So take a look, guys. I want to show you this now. Okay. This is the inventory. This is active inventory for existing homes. This is not new homes. New homes, we have way more inventory. Look at guys. Okay. This is good. Okay. We still have historically low inventory. This did update a few days ago. It updated April 4th. We have 694,000 active units. Remember, guys, I believe we need sustained about, say, eight to a million. If we get to eight to a million sustained, I think we're going to be okay. Again, so long as demand stays about the same. But take a look, guys, okay? Okay, so I just wanted to remind everyone, year over year, we're up. Okay, so February of 2023, we had 562. Now we have 694. We have an increase of inventory year over year. So, so year, year over year from here to here. You guys ready for this? Beautiful. It's working. Is it working fast enough? Maybe not fast enough, but thank God it's working. And you guys want to know what it's at from here to here? So February of 2022, we only had 354,000 units. You guys, we have a 96% increase from the low. So from here to here, okay, so from here to here, 96%. And because so much of my theory is like based on, okay, your prices have you know gone up, obviously emotion, but obviously a lack of inventory. So the fact that we are increasing inventory year over year over year is a good thing. We want it to be faster for sure. Uh, so, you know, we want it, and how would it be faster? How would it have been faster? Higher rates. Higher rates for, you know, higher rates. If we would have stayed 7 8% interest rates, it would, it would be happening faster. Plus the bank term funding program. Don't forget that bank term funding program was a pretty huge deal mm. as well. Uh, so we went over inventory, went over the appraisal. Let's go into our rent inflation video. I am worried about rent inflation. Um, super worried about it. rent inflation, actually. Uh, and I did a video with Jack. I totally bombed that video. I have a video with nobody special finance coming out as well this evening. I want you guys to take a listen to that. So let's go into our video on the, res on, um, rent inflation. Okay. Because this can be a major problem. If you guys can let me know that the audio is good.
getting some breaking news out of the New York Fed. For that, we'll turn to Steve Leisman. Hey, Steve. Carl, good morning. Uh, much anticipated inflation expectations numbers from the New York Fed, and they are mixed for the month of March. I'll go through them now. The one-year inflation expectations were unchanged at 3 percent. It's good news amid higher oil prices and other commodities that are unchanged, but they have been stuck at this three number for two months running now. Not sure how much concern they'll be on the part of the Fed. The three-year expectations up two-tenths to 2.9 while the five-year decline to 2.6, I think last month was an aberration at 2.9. It's now down more near its long-run average. However, before you get too excited about that, the Fed, New York Fed saying expected price changes increased for all goods in the survey. And there are some hefty ones. For example, rent went up by 2.6 percentage points to 8.7. Remember, we're looking for that to come down. Medical care up more than a percentage point. Food up and gas up as well. Interesting. These are separate questions. They ask about overall one-year expectations. Then they ask about individual prices over the next year. Unemployment expectations remained low in this. That's good news. But concern about job loss rose to the highest level since October 2020. It is up for a second straight month and now above the pre-pandemic level. That is concern about job loss, the probability of missing a debt payment. We've been watching that pretty closely. The issue of delinquencies rising to the highest level in four years. All of this happening in context of lessening uh, certainty about a rate cut. We're now, I don't know, dancing around that 50 percent line. We're at 51 percent now for June. We had been below 50 this morning. It's down from 65 percent before that strong Friday job support. July, I'd say, is also a little bit in play here. Now at 69 percent, down from 80 percent, Carl. So a lot of things in motion now. The Fed watching this um, inflation expectations number to get a gauge on whether they're winning the battle of the psychology of inflation. And they seem kind of stuck at this 3 percent level. All right, guys. So we're going to go into recession and liquidity right now. But real quick, I just wanted to address uh, Linda real quick. Linda, I didn't delete your comments. I got an email from Linda. She's like, why'd you leave my comments? I'm, I'm upset. Linda, you know, I would never do that to you. I appreciate you. Don't don't be mean to me. I got your email. It hurt my feelings, Linda. It hurt my feelings. It wasn't me. You know, it wasn't me, Linda. Anyways, I appreciate you. Okay. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us. I really, I, I remember you from the very beginning. Some people are just like burns it. And Linda was one. So when I got that email, Linda, it really hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but it did. It hurt my feelings um, because it wasn't true. All right, let's go into our recessionary stuff right now, you guys. Uh, and thank you for that super chat, brother, by the way. Let me give a shout out real quick uh, to our buddy, Chai Town. Chai you, you guys see what I'm talking? Chai Town, I appreciate you. I hope you're using the data to help people. I hope you're not using your emotion. You guys see, I'm not just pushing realtors away. I, I'm Honestly, I'm trying to help realtors as well because I understand I'm not so naive to like not acknowledge the fact that most consumers have to go through a realtor. And so if they have to go through a realtor, then part of the way to come up with a solution is also helping those professionals use the data. And the problem is, you guys, is, is I'm not saying like these realtors are evil. I'm not saying that. It's just the training is garbage, man. The training is bad. It's all like cheerleading training. Chai, can you back me up there? Is most of the training? I, I know you don't want to put your brokerage under, you know, throw them under the bus, but you know, man, um, you know, you're right, man. I am a shark boy. You know, you guys, I broke my ribs. Um, some people, I, I told you guys, I broke my ribs the other day. Someone's like, you broke your ribs, yeah, right? I'm like, why, why would I lie about? Like, what's wrong with these people, man? Like, why would I? Why am I? What, what, what purposes are lying? The, the transparency is key. It's always been key for our channel, but you guys, my ribs are all messed up right now. Um, show there is that. <laughs> yeah, it is garbage, right? Um, I'm on my own with training. Okay. Garbage. I mean, he gets it. He gets it. You guys get it. You guys get it. I love this guy, Raymond. You know, we love you, brother. I love you, Raymond. I, you know, I want to see you more and more. Hi buddy. How are you? You guys check out my other, I have a fishing channel. You know, I put a lot of heart into that. It's called Spartan Tackle. If you guys want to check that out. But anyways, going back into the recessionary stuff, I am so sorry. I'm rambling like a maniac right now. Ooh, somebody gets, someone's going to hate me. Take a look guys. Here's the inversion, the 10 and the two. This is one of the strongest indicators of an incoming recession. This is why people, you know, the bears are still even relevant because we will always have this massive historical indicator that says we have an incoming recession. And I also want to point out that we have been inverted for over two years, not sustained inversion, but the date from the original inversion, April 1st of 2022, we have been inverted for over 24 months. That's insane. That's insane. So th this is one of the longest times we've ever been inverted. Very, very interesting. Now, if I can ask you guys, do you guys think that we've been inverted this long because of this? 
the deficit spending. Okay, this is an update. We should be getting an update within. The, I would hope within the next couple of weeks on uh, March. Obviously, it's probably gonna. I'm gonna call it right now. It's gonna be a tr in the trillions. I, I think when this updates in March, we're gonna hit over a trillion. But I also wanted to point out the last time we had a surplus in federal in, for the federal government and the spending was 2001. 23 years ago, and they're not like Jordan. I don't know if you guys like Michael Jordan. That guy is the beast. I love Michael Jordan. Back when there was like real centers in basketball, even when Kobe Bryant, there was real centers. I don't even want to go into LeBron James. He drives me absolutely crazy. I apologize. Um, so <clears throat> here's the thing, you guys. I did list my property. <clears throat> Cyrus knows that. I did list my property for sale. I've got absolutely no interest. I put it at about market value. I have zero interest on the property. Uh, and in the meantime, I have another tenant. So I may just take the tenant. I wanted to sell my house. I wanted to get out, um, but I can't sell my house at market. And the thing is, guys, I'm so properly hedged in that house because I bought it in 2018 and I have a two point, I think either 2.3 or 2.5. So and my mortgage payment is, is cheaper than what I'm renting right now. And this is a crappy rental house. So it's just, it's just a very difficult decision I'm not taking lightly. Now, I wanted to keep going on to the recessionary indicators. Okay, so another indicator, again, is this deficit spending. Okay, so the economy is not doing good if there's deficit spending. But here's another indicator I wanted to tell you guys. Okay, so government jobs. Let me read this uh, regarding the last jobs numbers. Of the 303 new payroll jobs added according to the establishment survey, 71,000 of those were government jobs, or rather 23%. Okay, so on top of the deficit spending, remember government jobs feed recession. Historically, this ratio suggests an approaching recession. Okay, so we have not only the 10 and the 2 inversion, we have the government trying to manipulate the markets. Now, in times of solid economic growth, government jobs rarely make up more than 10 to 12 percent of job growth. Okay, so we have the government stimulating which is insane. So we have quantitative tightening and stimulation. But look at this. On top of that, guys, consumers aren't doing well. The savings rate right now is like the worst it's been in over a year. It's 3.6%. Okay? 3.6%. That's why I'm saying I don't think this is sustainable because consumers aren't the same as what they used to be. Because again, remember, during the last inflation battle, look at this. During the recession, look at it go up. The savings went up into recession to the double digits. Into the 12s, they saved at a rate of 12% and it went up in recession. Same thing here. In 1973, 74, it went up into recession. You see that? They were saving at 14%. You guys, we've been saving at 3%. I just don't see how this is sustainable. But not only that, here's the biggest thing of all probably. This is probably the, one of the biggest things. On top of unemployment, what does unemployment lead to? What I'm saying is delinquency, right? What, unemployment leads to delinquency, like foreclosure and things. Here's the delinquency rate. Here's what I want to say on delinquency rate. Look at the trajectory. This is a massive trajectory upward, but understand though, there's still more room to spend. There's still more room for consumers to be late. Even though this is horrible, there's still more room for horribleness because of the inflation, because of these things. We just paid our debt off. They, had, they can spend. Look at though, you guys, look at the GFC. So going into the GFC, we were, we were at like high threes to four. So we are still pretty decently far from GFC, but over the last 10 years, we're way high. Look at over the last 10 years. It was uh, about two and a half. See? So we are elevated over the last 10 years prior to, you know, prior to COVID, but from GFC levels, no. Okay. But the trajectory is very, very bad. So that's what I'm saying. So again, we have horrible deficit spending. We have massive amounts of government jobs. We have consumers that can't afford to save money or their bad spending habits. And we have defaults going up on consumer debt topped with this. Okay. And this is all kind of going back to the housing market, which is what my channel is about. This is what I don't think is sustainable. This is the equity growth, guys. Now, I brought this chart up because I want to talk and hopefully I'll be able to talk to Joe here soon. I want to talk to a bull because all the bulls like Dave Ramsey, oh, houses prices rebounded. But when we put median sales price for used and new, because what is a new home after it's sold? What is a new home after it's sold? It's a used home. It's existing, right? So it's now an existing home. So when we add that together, there is no rebound in prices. I want to make that clear. So I would ask a bull why? And they'll be like, because they're always like, oh, only 10% of sales are new homes. Well, then why is this data so jacked up? Why does this data bulls show only price decline for new homes? Why? 
And I'm going to tell you guys why, because it looks at the entire picture. It looks at both existing and it looks at new. But again, look at that run up. Isn't that crazy? And look at the fall from grace. Again, you can only see this when you look at the whole thing. When you X out existing, it does not look like that. And then when you X out and only look at new homes, it's even faster drop. <clears throat> but it's, this is quarterly, by the way, you guys. So this is quarterly. This is not monthly. So let's go into our last video. Okay, that's our recessionary. So we're going to go into our last video, which is going to be on CPI coming out on Wednesday and how important that is. So important, important stuff coming out on Wednesday. If you guys can, let me know that the audio is good. Sachs Chief Economist Jan Hatzius joins us, not at Post 9, but on the ground in Lake Como in Italy at the Ambrosetti Conference. Jan, uh, it is great to have you. Uh, I guess first your thoughts so on, on headline and how much uh -huh. should we appreciate some of the internals uh, like annual wage growth and participation. Orlando. This is my dude. Look, it was a relatively man. uncomplicated, strong report with a strong trend on, on payrolls, another upside surprise relative to consensus expectations, small drop in the unemployment rate, and a good increase in household employment after some weakness there. So I think on the economic activity side, this is very unambiguous. But as you say, the wage numbers have been decelerating and the month to month numbers are, you know, sometimes up, sometimes down. But the trend has been decelerating despite the strong labor market. And I think that's very encouraging for those of us who are looking for inflation yes. to move back to 2% before too long. Uh, Jan, you've talked in the past about paths to cuts. Uh, one, of course, is a job market deterioration. Uh, obviously, that doesn't seem to be happening in the near term, but the other is inflation coming down materially. So how does today's report kind of renew even more focus on next week's CPI number? I think the CPI number is going to be probably more important than the payroll number. The you know, possibility, though never likelihood, in, in our view of a weaker jobs market, getting the Fed to cut more quickly, uh, you know, I think that's sort of off the table and may cut us off the table with these numbers, was already close to off the table before this. So it's really going to be about inflation. If inflation uh, comes comes down further and you know the year on year rate has trended down core pce inflation is 2.8% now despite the higher month on month numbers over the last couple of months but if the the basic trend of decelerating inflation if that stays in place then i think we will see a cut by the middle of the year at the june meeting but i do think we will need to see those inflation numbers kind of settle down the frayed nerves at uh, you know at on the FOMC at least among among some people who've been talking more hawkishly Jan uh, this earlier this week there was a lot of attention on the fact that the ISM manufacturing indicators ticked back into expansion territory they've been you know dormant and weak and a drag on the economy for the better part of 2 years uh, and now with the strong jobs market you assume the consumer side of the economy is going to hold up uh, even if it seems like there's been some pockets of fatigue there. Does this mean the overall economy is reaccelerating in your view, or is it essentially just at a steady state? I think it's at a steady state. The economy is doing very well, and growth is, you know, we think for the year as a whole, probably close to 3% or close to 2.5% on a fourth quarter to fourth quarter basis. So very solid performance, but I don't see a, an acceleration. I see steady growth uh, with demand growing at a healthy pace, supply actually growing at an even faster pace. Mm. Yes, if you look right. at some of the signs of labor market rebalancing, I think they're telling you that while growth is strong, it's not the sort of growth that's going to create right. higher inflation. I think it's very mm -hmm. compatible with inflation coming down. Because well, we also got wars as well that is adding to the inflation, right? Obviously, if we're giving money to a country, they spend money back to us. 
I mean, it is what it is, y'all. Um, I wanted to tell you as well, and then I want to put up some comments and just really give you guys a lot of uh, a love. Um, but I have a, like I said, I think I told you guys in the beginning, I have a new Metro report journey going to happen this weekend. You guys, I'm very excited, very nervous, have a ton of anxiety. I'm going to be doing our Metro tour completely different. We're not just going to look at new home data anymore. When I was going around the nation earlier, I think I've done, I don't know, 30 videos around the nation. Um, I was only looking at new construction. And so now I'm going to be looking at, let me see again, existing homes, new homes, the long-term and short-term rental market, job market, demographics, and commercial real estate. And I'm going to start, uh, and this is a really big project, I, I, can't, I don't know how much longer I can afford to do this, you guys. I don't know how much longer. That's the problem with, with, with training and teaching. You, you, if you're not in sales, you get paid pennies. But uh, I'm really excited about it, you guys. We're going to do it completely different. We're going to do a whole bunch of B-roll and do the narrating at the end, kind of like a news report. And I'm going to be doing it with Melody. Melody is going to come with me. And also, Danielle DiMartino Booth has granted us a sit-down interview. So I was, like, I was thinking last night about that sit-down interview. I'm like, oh, my God. Dude, having a sit down interview with Daniel DiMartino would be so big in my, in my mind. It would be so big for me and for my channel. But then I stopped thinking about myself for one second. And then I was like, wait a minute. Melody has never done a collaboration. She's never done an interview. So I don't know if she's listening, but I was like, you know what, Melody? I was like, I'm not going to do the interview. I was like, I don't even want to put the interview on my channel. I want you to. Because I think this would be a big deal for you, Melody. So I, you know, so that, that's what's going on there. I'm so excited. You guys, I got new, I found about $500 worth of new audio equipment. So I'll be doing that. We're going to be touring uh, San Antonio, Austin, and San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas. And then also I'll be going with uh, meeting up with Austin and don't move to Texas uh, to give us his perspective as well. So we're going to be doing some interviews. I'm so excited about it, but I'm very scared because it's like leveling up my content. And, and, and the problem with leveling up content is a lot of times it doesn't equate to like it being better for the viewers. And so that's the hard part, you know, so I, because I love being creative. All right, guys, uh, really appreciate that. Vegas, love the support, man. You know, all these little tokens of support, it does mean a lot to me. I appreciate you. She is the bomb. Definitely is the bomb, man. I, I really enjoy her. Cindy, uh, big shout out to Cindy. I just want to do some, you know, hellos now. We're just going to do a little bit of Q&A type of stuff. Just really want to give a shout out to Cindy. Been with me since the beginning. I see your comments. Same with Kayleen. Really appreciate you. Cindy, I, I think Cindy's in Discord. Really appreciate you as well. Uh, remember, I'm not a financial advisor. Join our Discord, you guys, if you want to talk a little bit more. And you got people in the Discord that are way smarter than me. Where are the guys at in Discord? Raymond's in there. Dean's in there. Dean's a really cool guy as well. Oh, so I want to see you in the Discord. In the Discord, you guys, there's several people that have purchased property. Um, so it's interesting to see, you know, like strategies. We've been looking at purchase contracts, doing analysis and things like that. There's my man, Austin. I definitely appreciate you as well. Obviously there's my boy, Jeff. You guys, I remember me and Jeff used to talk. Uh, this was back in 2023 and me and him would always be going over his house and market together on Zillow. Uh, so when he finally bought his house, Jeff, I was a little heartbroken, dude. I was like, my man, I lost my man. I lost my man, Jeff. Oh my God. But you guys, he, he ended up getting a 50, I think it was $50,000 off on his house by doing a love letter. This man, this man right here, compelled the seller, tug at the seller's heart, put it on the table, breathe, right? This man got $50,000 off from writing a, a letter, a letter from his heart. Can you believe that? And that's just a little bit of the stuff uh, in Discord. Where's Charles at? All right, here's Johnny. Travis, check the available space on your memory cards. Yeah, so Johnny, Johnny's always keeping me sharp. This is my dude right here. I love him. He's always picking on me because he knows he can, because he knows I love him. And Johnny, I love you too. Love that guy. Uh, he's, oh, he's trolling. He's trolling. There's my girl. I am blessed. I am from the beginning. I really appreciate you. There's my man, WTH. I love her name, by the way. I always like to say we are. We are blessed. WTH, I really wish you well, man. There's Wendy. There's Sean from the beginning. Love you. Love you. There's my man, Jeff. There's Nikki from the beginning. Really appreciate you as well. You guys, I'm going to get out of here. Oh, no longer allowed in Denver. I did not know that. Here's the Discord. If you guys want to go to the Discord, it's also in my description. Look at this. Look at this, though. Love letters are no longer allowed in Denver. That's interesting. All right. Let me see this, too. Someone also said, realtors in my area said love letters don't work today, but Jeff is proof of work. So it's like, but the realtors, did the realtors say that? Because they're lazy. That's my, I don't know, right? Um, 
So anyways, I'm really excited. I'm so excited, you guys. I am so excited to do this Metro tour. I want to get out of the studio. I, 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 when I'm in the studio too much, like, I go crazy. I got to get out on the field. I want to bring you guys boots on the ground, eyes from the sky. I got my drone license from FAA just to show you guys what I'm saying. So st stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for this evening's video about how everyone is broke. I did that with Jack. Jack, if you're listening, I'm sorry for butchering the video. The video I did with Jack yesterday, I, I was totally off. So anyways, I love you guys. Happy Tuesday. Make great decisions. Don't forget to love yourself, love your life, love other people. And if you want to be part of a little community, it's not the biggest community, just join our Discord. Now, other than that, if you guys are out there investing in real estate, you guys already know I wish you luck. Everything's going to be chaptered and the data will be linked. And I hope you win.